Okay, okay go. here we go. Here's the redundancy. <laughs> the North Jersey Civil War Roundtable is known for the caliber of our speakers. Uh, we stress the military, socioeconomic aspects of the Civil War and its lasting legacy. Our members include noted historians, teachers, scholars, members of the judici judiciary, professionals, and others who are interested in Civil War. Some of our speakers have included two Pulitzer Prize winners, James McPherson and Eric Foner, Civil War icon Ed Bars, New Jersey historian John Cunningham, Rutgers professor Louis Mazur, uh, S.C. Gwynn, Craig Simons, uh, also honored at our dinner, James Bud Robertson, Thomas Fleming, and preeminent Lincoln scholar Michael Burlingame. Uh, we are a member of the at the color bearer level of American Battlefield Trust. We present annual awards at New Jersey History Day at William Patterson University in honor of our member, uh, the distinguished author, Emmy winner, and historian. Um, by the way, when I mention History Day, there's a History Day in every state in the United States. The winners go on to the University of Maryland. Um, please take a look at it and, and have your organization be part of it. Uh, it really gives a, a lot of nice publicity in the schools. Um, we are the only Civil War roundtable to present an annual Civil War legal presentation. Larry Cutler was on uh, one year, composed of distinguished judges and attorneys. This is strictly on a legal basis, not members, or not any regular speak. These are all professional. And a matter of fact, two years ago, uh, one of our lectures was offered as a civil, uh, uh, continuing the legal education program. So we heard it first and the lawyers pay, then paid two hundred dollars. But uh, that's the caliber of our program. It's it's not just a bunch of guys talking about cases. Uh we have a members only book or I mentioned that to you. Um it brings in those guys who are interested or people who are interested in reading discussions are really at a great level. And Judge John Harper provides these questions, which lead to really open discussion questions. And sometimes we only do in maybe one chapter of a book or maybe two chapters, but this is the discussion that goes on. Um, and then we invite our members to order it if they, if they choose to do so. But I think it's a unique contribution that we are. We were the sponsors of the unique medicinal plants of the Civil War Garden at the Freelinghausen Arboretum, which attracted thousands of visitors, and then who also listened in on their speaker, on their phones to the description of this. Uh, we now have, because of Zoom, I, Rest of us are local, you know, I don't know from this. We now have members from 11 states, including Barry Crompton, who's a member from Australia. Um, in addition, you'll say, I introduced Gene Embler before. As a public service, the links to our programs are being supplied at no cost to public libraries and are offers being extended. What happens is the library puts the program on their, uh, on their calendar. We supply them with the link and they, people respond to that link and uh, the library then sends them the link. Um, we don't want the library's list. So if you know a library, it could be anywhere for gosh sakes, it's a link. Uh, we'd be happy to carry the, we'd be happy to carry their programs. And it offers something else, uh, another program, uh, what the library is able to say is we're offering, we're also offering this. So it started to, exp it's, it's expanding. Although everybody seems to think it's a catch, it isn't, we got the money for it. We don't need it. Um, we are, although, although we're nonprofit, 501c3, we don't do fundraising. And if anybody wants to become a member, uh, membership, ready for this, $39. Um, now, let me list the hosts of the, uh, we're hosted tonight by the old bully Civil War Roundtable. We met Rich Jankowski, General Mead Society, not, and I don't see Andy on here. And Bucks County Civil War Roundtable is also sponsoring us. This mean, what this means is we just put your name on the on the caption. That's all. And we hope that you send it out. to. We hope the groups and the groups send it out to their members. And again, they don't have to list our, uh, our address. They can list their own address. But again, it opens it up. And that's why we got a, a really a nice uh, turnout. And for those of you, for the Congress of Civil War Roundtable, they have a um, an online, I just got an online paper. Mike Campbell sent it to me. And North Jersey Civil War Roundtable, Old Baldy, uh, were, and Bucks County, especially, also was listed prominently in this article. Um, I don't know how you go online to get it, but that is, uh, 
but then eventually called the light posts of the Congress of Civil War Roundtables. And okay, the libraries we have so far, uh, I wrote down for Chippany, uh, Kemmerer Library, Harding Township, Roxbury, Rockaway, uh, Hackettstown, Chester, and a few other uh, libraries that are on there. And again, we welcome, we welcome everybody. Okay, next, uh, let me introduce our speaker. That wasn't bad. I'm seven oh one. Uh, Jeffrey William Hunt is the director of Texas Military Forces Museum at Camp Mabry in Austin, Texas, which is the official museum of the Texas National Guard and an adjunct professor of history at Austin Community College, where he has taught since 1988. Prior to taking post at Texas Military Forces Museum in 2007, he was a curator of collections and director of the Living History Program at the Admiral Nimitz National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas, for 11 years. He holds a bachelor's degree in government and a master's in history, both from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, in 2013, he was appointed as honorary admiral in the Texas Navy by Governor Rick Perry in recognition of his efforts to tell the story of the Texas Navy during the Texas Revolution and Republic. In 2018, his Meade and Lee after Gettysburg received the Gettysburg Civil War Roundtable Distinguished Book Award. 22, he was awarded the Edward Hold, oh, Ed Bars, Award for the Outstanding Civil War Scholarship. He's a veteran reenactor with 30 years experience participating in a wide variety of events from the War of 1812 through Vietnam. He's the author of The Last Battle of Civil War, Palmetto Ranch, Meade and Lee after Gettysburg, the forgotten final stage of the Gettysburg campaign, Meade and Lee at Bristow Station, uh, Meade and Lee at Rappahannock Station, uh, and he's also contributed to the Essential Civil War Curriculum, Revised Handbook of Texas, uh, the Gale Library of Public Life, North and South Magazine, and his next book we just mentioned before is Immediately at Mine Run, uh, forthcoming from Sabbath Beach. I got to tell you something before you get on. What we do is because the, to the libraries who uh, are carrying our program, we purchase the book from Sabbath Speedy, we, and we donate it to the library. So in a library, when the as, in as much as you can't sell a book in our meeting, uh, or now if you want to put up something, how to do it. But we purchased the book directly from Sabbath Speedy and we hand deliver it to the library. Jeff, you're on. Uh, the, the topic for tonight is the first half of my uh, second book in the Mead and Lee's uh, series, uh, a series that deals with the war in Virginia from the moment that Lee slips across the Potomac uh, during the Gettysburg campaign through the end of the campaigning in 1863. This is six months of the war that has been largely ignored uh, in history. Uh, it gets touched on in regimental histories and some biographies, uh, but there really hadn't been very much uh, a, a scholarship done on this period of the war. Uh, and uh, I, I became fascinated with uh, this period uh, in college uh, and uh, went to look uh, to find in the library to find out more about it. Lo, but there wasn't anything there, uh, and so I had to dive in and do the original research myself. And eventually decided uh, that this was way too good a story uh, to remain uh, sort of in the shadows of Civil War history. Uh, so I decided to write uh, some books about it. Uh, and initially, it was going to be one book, and then it became two, and then it became three. And now it's going to be four. Uh, but tonight's topic is going to deal with the the second of those, uh, and that is um, the first half of the the book, Meet and Lee uh, at Bristow Station, because it's such a big topic. We're we're breaking it in half, uh, doing uh, the period August first, October fourth, eighteen sixty three, tonight, and then in April. I'll be back to talk about the Bristow Station uh, campaign itself. So sort of to set everything up, I have to remember what happens in the final phase of the Gettysburg campaign. Most people think that the Gettysburg campaign ends when Lee retreats across the Potomac River, and then that, that is indeed where most books uh, about uh, Gettysburg come to an end. But in fact, there was an entire last phase of the war, uh, of that campaign, whether uh, below the Potomac, uh, as Meade uh, moves his army into the Loudoun Valley, uh, and Lee has moved his army into the Shenandoah Valley, and for the next 10 days, uh, these two generals play a, a pretty dramatic chess match against one another, uh, with the Blue Ridge Mountains and a flooded Shenandoah River uh, separating their armies. 
uh, Meade had a chance uh, to try and push his way through the uh, mountain passes in the Blue Ridge to get into the Shenandoah and potentially cut Lee off in the lower part of the valley and try and do to him on the south bank of the Potomac what he had been unable to do to him on the north bank of the Potomac, which was to substantially destroy his army. Uh, but in a series of dramatic engagements at Manassas Gap uh, and elsewhere, Lee manages to get through the mountains uh, and return to central Virginia, where his army comes to a stop in Culpeper County. Uh, the federal army, by the time uh, this happens, is almost destitute of rations. It's forced to break contact with the uh, A and B and withdraw to Warrington, Virginia, where it can reconnect with the Orange and Alexandria Railroad uh, and the supply depots in Washington. So uh, on July 25th of 1863, this is where you find the two armies. The Army of the Potomac is basically clustered around Warrington uh, here. Uh, this is the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Uh, here you have the upper Rappahannock River, uh, and uh, there is the Rapidan there. And in this area right here is Culpeper County, uh, where Lee has brought his army uh, to rest. And so for the first time since Gettysburg, the two armies are now really out of contact with each other. There's about 23 miles uh, separating them. The question, of course, is uh, what was going to happen next, because even at this point, uh, we are not really done with the Gettysburg campaign as far as Meade is concerned. His intention uh, is once his army is resupplied, and that only takes a couple of days, uh, to push down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad to uh, cross the Rappahannock River and see whether Lee is going to stand and fight. Uh, Lee is willing to push down uh, the Orange and Alexandria to see how Lee will react, whether his Gettysburg battered army will stand and make a fight along the Rappahannock or in Culpeper or indeed even along the Rapidan. Uh, so uh, Meade is preparing to continue his advance. Lee, on the other hand, uh, is not determined to make a stand here in Culpeper County and for very good reasons. And, and uh, so we need to spend some time to understand why Lee and later uh, Meade will think that Culpeper is a really bad place uh, to have their army. So the uh, Culpeper County uh, area has seen a lot of the war, especially in the 1862 campaigns. It's midway between Washington and Richmond. It is the cockpit of the war uh, for a lot of 1862 and uh, the second half of 1863. So Culpeper County is uh, formed by the upper Rappahannock River, which is its northern and eastern boundary, and the Rapidan River, which is its southern boundary. Its western boundary is partially formed by Robinson's River, but which is really just an oversized creek unless it's uh, flooded. Uh, but this area here, uh, if you look at it on a map, appears as though it's a sideways V, uh, a V that's been tipped over uh, with the, its maw opening toward the foothills that eventually lead you uh, to uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. So if you're a Confederate army that's looking to march into the Shenandoah in order to invade the North, uh, then this is a great place to have your army. But if you're trying to defend this region, it's a very bad place to have your army. And for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, Culpeper County here is not wide. If you enter it along the Origin Alexandria Railroad at Rappahannock Station and then trace your way through Culpeper Courthouse, which is the county seat, and in the center of Culpeper County, and then follow the ONA down to Rappahannock Station, that's a distance of only 23 miles. And so that's not much depth at all. And of course, as you get closer to the apex of the county, where the upper Rappahannock uh, is met by the Rapidan before the Rappahannock flows on down toward Fredericksburg uh, and Chesapeake Bay, then of course the distance becomes much, much, much more narrow. Nowhere in Culpeper County is there, as Lee put it, a field for battle. In other words, there's no place in Culpeper County uh, where you could anchor both flanks of a battle line uh, with security. It's a very beautiful part of Virginia. Uh, the terrain is undulating, uh, is a, lo a lot of open ground with the occasional forest. It's got a fairly good road net, uh, but uh, it is, from a tactical standpoint, uh, not really a good place to fight a battle. And one of the reasons that it's not is the shallowness of it. So if you fight a battle and you lose it, you don't have to retreat very far before you find yourself backed up against a river. 
And although both of these rivers have lots of fords across them, there are hardly any bridges. And in fact, the two main bridges are the railroad bridges here at Rappahannock Station and the railroad bridge here at Rappahannock Station. And that 500 foot long railroad bridge has been burned since the beginning of the Fredericksburg campaign. The Federals burned it when Burnside uh, made his lunge toward Fredericksburg along the northeastern uh, shores of the Rappahannock. And so it's laying in ruins. Uh, and so um, you have to rely on the forts to cross this river. And of course, the problem with forts is that they can disappear. It doesn't take much rain for the upper Rappahannock or the Rapidan to flood. In fact, one of the reasons the Rapidan gets its name is how quickly it could flood. Uh, and so if you fought a battle and you were forced back across against this river and you had to cross it and the weather turned against you, your army could wind up being trapped. Uh, and so whether you were trying to defend from a thrust to the south or against a thrust from the north, this is just really a very poor place to keep your army. Uh, Lee had paused here to give his troops a little bit of break after they had managed to escape the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, but by late July, the beginning of August, he's decided he's not going to leave his infantry here. He's going to pull it back behind the Rapidan, which is much, much more defensible, and just leave Jeb Stewart's cavalry here to be a buffer uh, against the oncoming Federals. For Meade's part, he believes that an advance into Culpeper County is what the Lincoln administration wants him to do. Uh, after Lee had gotten across the Potomac on July 14th of 1863, Halleck had sent him orders that said Lee uh, should be pursued and his, uh, wherever he has gone and his army cut up. Those orders have never been rescinded. So Meade has resupplied uh, and he is now preparing to continue the pursuit of the Confederate Army as he had been ordered to do uh, after uh, the Confederates got across the Potomac uh, back on July 14th. Uh, he dutifully sends word of that to Washington, to Major General uh, Henry W. Halleck, who's the General in Chief of all the Union land forces, and he says, I'm preparing to push into Culpeper. Uh, I think this is a bad avenue of advance, but we'll see if Lee will stand and fight. And if he retreats, then the Army of the Potomac could leap the Rappahannock and potentially the Rapidan River, two major obstacles, without a fight. And this would be a very big gain uh, for the Northern War effort. To Meade's surprise, however, he gets a message back from Halleck, who is relaying a message from President Lincoln that basically says, whoa, wait just a second. Uh, we have no expectation of you continuing this pursuit at all. Uh, and we are not pressuring you. You can do it if you want, but don't do it on the grounds that Washington is pressuring you. Uh, and Lincoln sort of snidely remarks that if it had been unsafe for me to attack Lee at Williamsport, above the Potomac, uh, and, and he was unable to do that and accomplish anything, that it was kind of silly to believe that he could accomplish anything uh, now that Lee uh, was back in central Virginia. Uh, on top of this, of course, Halleck tells Meade, we can't let you make a general advance that might bring on a major battle because we have no reinforcements to send you. As Halleck says, every place has been stripped bare, if you suffer a lot of casualties, we cannot make those casualties good. And in addition, Halleck warns me that it might be necessary for me to begin to withdraw troops from your army and send them north to enforce the draft. So we know that the North is actually facing a very serious manpower problem. We're very used to the, uh, thinking about the Confederates having a manpower problem. But in the late summer of 1863, the North is in confronting a similar difficulty. Volunteering has, for all intents and purposes, uh, dried up. Uh, and the Congress has passed a Conscription Act. The conscription was very unpopular. Uh, and in the middle of July, there had been the draft riots in New York. There was resistance in other places. Uh, and uh, although troops had put down the rioting in New York, the draft had been suspended. Uh, and it could not be resumed until there was assurance that there would not be more riots. There would be uh, more flare-ups. That, that would, of course, be devastating for the Union cause. And the only way to make sure that didn't happen was to have enough troops in the trouble spots uh, to cow the potential protesters and keep them from 
causing additional difficulty. It was very important that the draft be resumed as quickly as possible because the North is running out of men. There is a great fear, in fact, an expectation that in the spring, the three-year men whose enlistments will be up will do what the two-year men had mostly done, and that is that they'll go home. Uh, and that will be a devastating blow to the federal army, which will leave lose the bulk of its trained manpower. Uh, and you had better get the men who are going to replace those soldiers into the ranks now so that you have time to harden them and train them so that they can carry the load uh, after this uh, happens. Meade, who is no fan of conscription, he believes it's not going to bring in the number of troops that are needed. It's not going to bring in the right kind of troops uh, that are needed. Uh, it's not going to bring in the men who are determined to fight and potentially die to save the Union. Uh, isn't necessarily surprised by any of that. And this dread of heavy casualties and the impact of those casualties on both his own army and the Northern war effort are something that's always going to be in the back of his mind. He knows that every battle that has been fought has been bloodier, than the previous battle that the Army of the Potomac is shrinking. Uh, and if you go and fight big battles and suffer lots of casualties, but gain no strategic fruit from those victories, uh, they're as good as defeats uh, for every purpose except morale. Uh, if you're going to suffer big casualties, me believes you need to gain something from suffering those casualties. And so this is going to be one of the drivers of his generalship. So he's getting these orders from Halleck. We're not expecting you to advance. You can't go instigate a big battle because we can't reinforce you, and I might have to start pulling troops away from you in order to enforce the draft. But then Halleck says, but keep up a threatening attitude. Keep keep Lee on edge. Don't, don't completely back off. And so for Meade, uh, he is forced to bring his army up short on the upper Rappahannock River. However, this business of uh, keeping up a threatening attitude uh, entails a consideration of what Northern strategy is going to be going forward. And this is where the Orange and Alexandria Railroad really becomes the centerpiece of so much of what is going to happen going forward. The Orange and Alexandria Railroad, of course, begins at Alexandria on the Potomac, just across the river from Washington. And then it goes southwest until it hits the Rappahannock River, the Upper Rappahannock River, where it crosses the river, or at least did, on uh, the railroad bridge at Rappahannock Station. Then it goes due south uh, to Culpeper and across the Rapidan, and finally ends at Gordonsville, where it meets the Virginia Central, which is, of course, connecting the Shenandoah Valley uh, to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, uh, and Potomac Railroad, which would take you on in uh, to Richmond. The problem with the ONA for a federal army, using it as an axis uh, of advance is, is multifaceted. First, it's a single track railroad, uh, which means that you're going to have to manage it very carefully if it's going to be able to supply a 90,000 man army like the Army of the Potomac. Uh, in addition, all of that railroad runs through Confederate territory. And what does that mean? The entire length of it is vulnerable to Confederate raids. It's vulnerable to the actions of Confederate guerrillas like John Mosby, who can burn bridges, destroy culverts, rip up tracks, ambush train. Uh, and in order to therefore keep the railroad operating as a viable federal supply line, it's necessary to guard the entire length of that railroad. And already the Federals are deploying 5,000 infantry to guard the railroad from the Potomac River down to basically the Rappahannock River. And as the Federal Army advances down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, if it pushes into Culpeper County and pushes the Confederates back toward the Rapidan and then pushes them over the Rapidan, then there's more and more of that railroad that has to be protected. So as the Army of the Potomac were to advance southwesterly down the ONA, it's got to spool out ever more men to guard its line of supply. And of course, on the front end of that advance, what this means is that the Army of the Potomac is losing combat power. It's getting weaker and weaker and weaker the further it advances south. And this is one of the reasons that Meade believes that this is a very bad axis of advance. Not only does the Orange and Alexandria Railroad not really go toward any place that the Confederates must absolutely defend, although Gordonsville is a pretty important target, the difficulty is that Lee, not having to defend any particular place, can keep backing up. He can lure the Federals deeper and deeper and deeper into the South 
forcing them to spool out those railroad guards as they go until he finds good ground where he can turn and fight, probably behind entrenchments, uh, Meade reckons. Uh, and at that moment, the Army of the Potomac will not have the numerical superiority necessary to overcome the Confederate defenses. And after the bloodletting of a big battle, Meade's afraid, it could be possible that the Army of Northern Virginia would suddenly be superior in numbers to the Army of the Potomac. And for this reason, Meade believes that going down the ONA is a really bad idea. What he would prefer to do and what he's going to advocate numerous times in the next five months is to abandon the ONA, shift the Army's line of supply to a Kia landing uh, on the Potomac, uh, and from there you can have a 15-mile railroad trip down uh, to Fredericksburg, uh, cross the Rappahannock River there, uh, and you are on the wreck line to Richmond, which, of course, the Confederates absolutely must defend. This would give the Army of the Potomac a much shorter supply line, one that was principally over water and therefore was much safer. It would require far, far fewer troops to protect that supply line than the ONA, and it would put Meade in a position where he could potentially force Lee to fight on ground of the Federals choosing not Lee's choosing. And as far as Meade is concerned, the logic of this is abundantly obvious. Uh, and so he doesn't like the ONA as a line of advance, but uh, when he proposes shifting over to Aquia Landing and advancing toward Fredericksburg, uh, he is absolutely shot down by Lincoln and Halleck who are appalled at the idea of taking the Army of the Potomac back to the scene of its worst disaster less than uh, a year after that disaster took place. And this is a particularly bad idea with congressional elections coming up uh, in October. Uh, this could be used by the Democrats uh, as a way of condemning Lincoln uh, and his administration and their, uh, their conduct of the war. So Meade is told you can make whatever tactical maneuvers you want, but we're not going to change your axis of advance. Well, what does that mean? Even though Meade has been told that he has to uh, pull his army up uh, on the upper Rappahannock, uh, he's still supposed to keep up this threatening attitude. So he advances his cavalry, uh, toward the Upper Rappahannock, and then he moves the 1st and the 12th Corps, as well as the 2nd Corps, toward the river. By this point, Lee has begun to pull much of his infantry below the Rapidan, but he still has most of Longstreet's Corps around Culpeper Courthouse. If Meade wants to keep up a threatening attitude, and he believes that he potentially at some point is going to be allowed to resume the offensive, and that offensive is going to have to go down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, then the railroad state uh, railroad bridge at Rappahannock Station becomes all important because until that part of the river is seized by the Federals and held so that the railroad bridge can be re rebuilt, uh, then the Federals would not be capable of advancing very far because their supply line uh, could not follow them. So on August 1st of 1863, uh, the Federals move across the upper Rappahannock River. Uh, the 12th Corps, the night before, seizes Kelly's Ford, uh, which is the best place to cross the river uh, in terms of fords and terrain. Uh, but Buford's Cavalry Division crosses right at Rappahannock Station, and then it pushes south toward Culpeper. It runs into a very weak Confederate Cavalry Brigade under Colonel Lawrence Baker. This used to be Hampton's Brigade. But, of course, Wade Hampton had been wounded at Gettysburg, so Baker's now in command. Uh, you've got a whole federal division coming down on a Confederate brigade that numbered only about 950 men. Uh, and its horses are in such bad shape that when Baker is forming them into line of battle to resist Buford's advance, some of the horses absolutely collapse under the weight of their riders. They've been so broken down and have been so poorly fed. And Baker has to send all of his men who have uh, essentially disabled horses to the rear. So he, his brigade is, is even weaker uh, yet. Buford uses his superior numbers adroitly. And over the course of the day, he steadily pushes Baker back toward Culpeper Courthouse and actually gets within a couple of miles there uh, when Confederate reinforcements arrive on the field uh, to save Baker's command from basically being annihilated. You have Grumble Jones Cavalry Brigade and a battery of artillery that come in from the Northwest. And then you have 
uh, two brigades of infantry from Richard Anderson's division that rush up to Baker's assistance. And when these Confederate forces converge, uh, then the table is turned. Uh, Buford is now the one whose flank is threatened. He's outnumbered, and he's forced to make a fighting retreat all the way back virtually to the Rappahannock River. So this is a dramatic day-long fight. Uh, it frustrates Buford mightily for a couple of reasons. One of those is uh, that he he very much did not like being supported by Union infantry. Uh, he, he complains that the ground he takes, he wishes to hold, that this is pointless to advance and then yield the ground. Uh, the other difficulty, of course, is that there's a, a horrible heat wave uh, that is uh, in engulfing uh, Virginia uh, in August of 1863. And so this battle has been fought with temperatures uh, in the 90s, and it was brutal on the men and the horses. Uh, nonetheless, this operation does achieve its primary goal. The Federals have, have seized Kelly's Ford on the upper Rappahannock, and they've seized Rappahannock Station, and Union uh, Railroad engineers within just five days are going to reconstruct that railroad bridge uh, at, at the river where uh, Rappahannock Station is. And as a consequence of that, Meade now has the wherewithal, if he wants, to continue his advance. But of course, he cannot do that until he is given the green light by the Lincoln administration. And as it turns out, that green light is not going to be given uh, for six weeks. And then it's going to be given under uh, very extraordinary circumstances. So what happens now is that uh, for the next six weeks, both the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac are finally going to get some rest after Gettysburg. Uh, both of them are going to have a chance to recuperate uh, and to renew their strength. And in fact, they do this very, very quickly. Uh, by the beginning of September, uh, Meade's army is going to have uh, just under 90,000 men uh, present for duty. So it's basically back to its July 1st, 1863 uh, strength. The Army of Northern Virginia is going to recuperate just as fast. And by the beginning of September of 1863, Lee is going to have 74,000 men uh, in the ranks. So Lee is almost back to his full Gettysburg strength as well. And so in a sense, this uh, means that Gettysburg, as dramatic as it has been and as bloody as it was, is just like all the great big battles that had preceded it. And there had been a lot of fighting. There had been a lot of casualties. Uh, the armies had both been badly hurt by it. They had drawn apart after the action was over. And then within a very short period of time, they have recuperated completely. Uh, of course, every battle leaves its lasting scars. You've lost some good officers and you've lost some good men. Uh, and the replacements are not always up uh, to the same level of the troops who have fallen. Uh, but nonetheless, by the time you get to the start of September, uh, the ANV and the AOP are essentially where they were at Gettysburg, uh, not only in terms of strength, but of course, they're almost physically exactly where they were uh, at the start of the uh, Gettysburg campaign. Lee's infantry is behind the Rapidan. The Federal infantry is above the Rappahannock. Uh, Stewart's cavalry is occupying Culpeper County as a buffer between them. Uh, and uh, both armies have shaken off uh, the, the hangover of Gettysburg, if you will, uh, and are uh, in pretty good shape, re ready to go again. Uh, it is also, of course, in uh, early August that Robert E. Lee sends that very famous letter uh, to Jefferson Davis uh, and proposes that he select someone else to command the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, Lee has been uh, wounded by the criticism of himself and his army in the newspapers. He's afraid that he's lost the confidence of his troops. Oh, Lee says they've been too generous to display uh, any ill feelings uh, toward him. Uh, he mentions that his own health is not what it used to be. He, he can't go out and do the personal reconnaissance anymore that he feels is so necessary to success. Uh, and he believes that uh, the Confederate cause is so important that Davis ought to pick a younger, more capable man to lead the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, so kind of interesting, uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, the victorious General Meade, of course, 
doesn't ask, but demands to be uh, replaced as the commander of the Army of the Potomac when he learns that Lincoln was uh, dissatisfied with his performance in the pursuit of Lee. Uh, Halleck had managed to fend that off and, and make a, a linguistic retreat, uh, changing dissatisfaction to disappointment. Uh, but uh, Meade was retained in command, and so is Lee, but not in the same way because Davis writes a very heartfelt letter back to Lee and basically says, don't worry about the newspapers. Don't, your troops are behind you. You're a great general and you have a great army and you're already famous in, in the history books. And uh, you know that if there were a better, more capable man to take command than you, if the Almighty would present such a person, I would not hesitate to use him. Uh, but the Almighty hasn't presented such a person. Uh, and I can think of no person who is more beloved in the army, more trusted in the army, more trusted in the country than you, no better person to command the Army of Northern Virginia uh, than you. So Lee, like Meade, is retained in command. Lee very much wants to resume the offensive. He doesn't like being beaten, and he hasn't been beaten very often, but Gettysburg was unquestionably a defeat. Uh, he continues to feel that the best way that a smaller Confederate army can deal with a larger Union army is to be aggressive, to keep the Federals off balance, to make them play the Confederate game instead of allowing the Federals to concentrate their forces and use their numerical and material advantage uh, against uh, a weaker army of Northern Virginia. Uh, Lee is making these sounds of going over to the offensive as his army is recovering, uh, but he really begins to push the idea of the offensive uh, as you get to the end of August and the beginning of September of 1863, and word begins to come into Richmond uh, from the Western Theater that the Federal Army of the Cumberland under William S. Rosecrans has begun its advance on Chattanooga. Uh, General Braxton Bragg, in command of the Confederate Army of Tennessee, has called the rebel forces uh, defending East Tennessee to his army to reinforce them. This has led uh, the Confederates to uh, basically abandon the defense of Knoxville, which is the target of another Union army that is marching out of eastern Kentucky under the command of Ambrose Burnside. The Confederates don't know if Burnside is heading toward Knoxville, if he's heading toward a junction with Rosecrans. Uh, that's the thing they're most afraid of, because if those two armies join, the Federals are going to be way too powerful uh, for Bragg to deal with. But all of this, of course, is a crisis for the Confederacy, because to lose Knoxville and to lose Chattanooga is to lose the only direct rail line linking Virginia to the Western uh, Confederacy. The question is, how do you respond to that? What, what do you do in the face of this potential uh, crisis? And so to try and come up with an answer, Davis calls Lee to Richmond. Uh, and Lee is going to spend a week in conference with the Confederate president. And the question they have to answer uh, is sort of similar to the same question that the Confederacy dealt with uh, in the spring of 1863. Only then the city that was threatened was Vicksburg. Now it's Chattanooga. But problem is the same. You have a vital city that is under threat of a very powerful federal army. Uh, and how is that threat to be met? And as had been the case in May of 1863, as is now the case in late August and early September of 1863, there are only two options, really. There are only two options. And one of those options is uh, to take troops from Lee's army, which is the only viable source of reinforcements for the West, and ship them out there, uh, reinforce Bragg so that he can go over to the offensive, defeat Rosecrans' army, and drive it away. There's option one. Option two is for the Army of Northern Virginia to launch an offensive in the east that would hopefully wreck the Army of the Potomac, threaten Washington, D.C., and force the Federals to withdraw troops from the Western Theater to save their capital. So that sounds like the argument that you had had in Richmond before Lee launched the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, there's a reason. They, it's exactly the same case. It's just the target city now is different. And as has been the case in May of 1863, uh, Lee prefers going over to the offensive in Virginia. Uh, he thinks that if you shift troops to the West, they will probably get there too late. And although he does not say it, 
Uh, it's pretty easy to read between the lines. He does not necessarily think that if those troops are sent there, they will be well used, that what you're trying to accomplish could be accomplished. And more importantly, if you send enough troops west to give Bragg a real chance, he would so weaken the Army of Northern Virginia that it would probably be impossible for it to hold Richmond. Uh, and so Lee is basically saying, you've got your choice. You can save Chattanooga or you can defend Richmond. It's an either or thing. Uh, and Davis agrees with them. As Davis had agreed with them in the spring, Davis now agrees with them at the start of the fall. And he tells Lee that you can go ahead and launch an offensive against Meade. And Lee actually sends orders to James Longstreet, who was left in command of the army when Lee came to Richmond and says, get the army ready. Uh, we're going to go over to the attack. Uh, Longstreet is not keen on this. Uh, he thinks that the decision should have gone the other way. Uh, that the troops should be taken from Lee and sent west. Uh, in fact, he also believes that he should not only go with those troops, but he should go out there and replace Bragg uh, and lead the Confederate Army of Tennessee and its reinforcements in the defense of Chattanooga. Uh, but Davis has made his decision. Lee has his orders. It looks like we're going to have another campaign against the Army of the Potomac by the Army of Northern Virginia. But just as the Confederates are preparing uh, for an offensive. The word comes in, uh, much to the shock of the Richmond administration, that Bragg has abandoned Chattanooga. The Federals have marched into Knoxville. The worst has already happened. By this point, Longstreet's Army, uh, Longstreet's uh, Army Corps has been uh, told that uh, you're going to have to abandon your offensive attention. So the A and V, in the face of this, no more offensive. Longstreet's Corps is shipped back to Richmond uh, for transfer to the Western Theater. Uh, not all of it is going to go. Only two of its divisions, in fact, are going to go uh, west. Some of its troops, Georgia brigades mostly, are going to be sent uh, into the Carolinas. Uh, the reason for that is not only that uh, Charleston is is uh, hard pressed by the Federals, their threats elsewhere in the Carolinas, but there's a fear that as those troops get close to their homes, there would be a lot of desertion. Uh, so they're going to be left behind. Uh, the Confederates' original intention uh, was to send Longstreet to Chattanooga to recapture that place and then send him down uh, to help Chattanooga. But before that operation can be launched, both places have fallen. And so now he's got to take this long roundabout route, 700 miles, very famous railroad movement uh, to reinforce Bragg uh, in time to fight at the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, so this is what happens. Longstreet's uh, core uh, most of it goes west between September 7th and September 14th of 1863. It's one of the great strategic rail movements uh, of the war. Uh, but in the Eastern Theater, the impact, of course, is very dire because before Longstreet left, Lee had about 74,000 men. After Longstreet leaves, Lee has about 55,000 men. Meade's army has sent about 10,000 men north to enforce the draft, uh, but the, uh, that, that really hasn't weakened Meade's strength at all. His, his returns are exactly the same because he's getting you know convalescents coming in and conscripts and that sort of thing. So the odds against the Army of Northern Virginia have grown much, much longer. And of course, the only thing the Confederates can hope here is that the Federals will not learn of Longstreet's transfer uh, for a while, that there'll be a breathing space uh, before the Federals can really make a threat. Uh, that breathing space is not going to happen. The Federals were picking up rumors of Longstreet's transfer uh, almost as soon as it began. Uh, the reports were coming from Richmond. They were coming from North Carolina. Uh, the administration in Washington wasn't certain whether or not to believe them. Uh, they asked Meade, is it true that a large part of the Army of Northern Virginia has departed for somewhere else where we don't know. Uh, Meade says, well, I haven't seen anything, uh, but uh, I can't say for certain. And, and the response from Washington is, well, you need to find something out. Uh, and so on September 13th of 1863, Meade sends Major General Alfred Pleasant's entire cavalry corps uh, into Culpeper County for the purposes of finding something out. Uh, so Gregg's division, coming down through Rixieville, Beaufort, down the line of the ONA, 
Kilpatrick uh, crossing at Kelly's Ford and then coming up to Brandy Station, all three divisions to converge on Culpeper Courthouse. And if they can get there, move toward the Rapidan. And of course, what this movement is supposed to show is whether or not there's Confederate infantry close enough as there had been at the beginning of August, to support the Confederate cavalry. And so what we get here uh, is yet another battle of Brandy Station. It's a very dramatic two days of fighting. Uh, The Federals uh, come across the river. Uh, Stuart has a couple of cavalry brigades there uh, to meet them. Uh, The Federals, of course, outnumber the Confederates mightily. Uh, Stuart has to defend Culpeper Courthouse for a certain period of time because he stockpiled a lot of supplies there, uh, and he can't whisk those supplies away until the daily train shows up. And so he has to fight this delaying action as the Federals steadily push him back toward Culpeper Courthouse. And by uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the Confederates are now uh, making a sort of final stand on the ridge above Culpeper, and Buford and Kilpatrick's cavalry divisions uh, are poised to assault the town. And this is what it looked like from the federal position. Both Edwin Forbes and Alfred Wode are accompanying Pleasanton's cavalry uh, to the great advantage of history. Uh, and so uh, that they're making some great drawings about the action here. But this is Culpepper right there. Uh, the Confederates are here along the ridge. Here are the Federals on the opposing ridge. And down here in this little valley is the uh, very rugged and nasty little stream called Mountain Run. Uh, the Federals are going to use their numerical advantage uh, very adroitly. Uh, but the, the, the dramatic moment of the battle really uh, is a federal drive to push across Mountain Run uh, into Culpeper Courthouse. And by this point, uh, Stewart has withdrawn most of his uh, cavalry uh, from what is clearly a, a trap. The Confederate horse artillery is the rear guard, and the federal storm against that Uh, the uh, second New York Cavalry making a charge across uh, Mountain Run and coming up a very steep hillside to fall upon the Confederate artillery, while uh, Custer's Brigade uh, made an attempt to get across Mountain Run, didn't actually get across it very easily, but Custer and a small contingent from the headquarters uh, did, and they make a wild dash uh, against the Confederate artillery and draws attention. The Confederates fire at Custer, actually take down uh, a trooper next to him. Custer is slightly wounded, but the Federals managed to overrun two of the Confederate uh, field pieces. And as the remaining Confederate artillery retreats through Culpeper, uh, they, they managed to capture a third gun. So September 13th of 1863 is a really, really bad day uh, for Jeb Stewart's horse artillery. Uh, The Confederates make a stand south of town, uh, and there is another round of fighting here. The Confederates, of course, are putting up a very stubborn defense here on the slopes of Pony Mountain. Uh, The Federals really can't budge them uh, off of their defensive position, uh, and at nightfall, the Confederate cavalry pulls back toward the Rapidan. Uh, Of course, uh, behind the Rapidan, you also have the infantry of the Army of Northern Virginia. The next morning, uh, the Federals are going to follow uh, down to the Rapidan. They're going to get there, uh, and this is going to initiate a round of skirmishing uh, along the river at all of the major fords and around the Rappahannock Station Railroad Bridge. Uh, Alfred Wode draws this picture uh, of the fighting around uh, one of the fords here, and you can see uh, one of the things about Culpeper that uh, counting that's very important is that the high ground is either on the south side of the Rapidan or on the north side of the Rappahannock, uh, so that Culpeper is almost in kind of a bowl, uh, and that means that if you are the Confederates, uh, the below the Rapidan is easy to defend, but uh, below the Rappahannock is really hard to defend. Uh, the Federals cannot make a dent here uh, in the Confederate defenses. Uh, Pleasanton is able to confirm that there is Confederate infantry behind the Rapidan, and that infantry is determined to stand and fight. But he's also able to confirm for Meade and thus for Lincoln and Halleck that Longstreet is gone that Longstreet is no longer with the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, that doesn't tell you where Longstreet has gone. He could have gone to southeastern Virginia like he had uh, after Fredericksburg. He could have gone to some other point. But, of course, the logical assumption is that he's gone west 
uh, to help the Confederates in Tennessee and Georgia. And so Meade now has to decide what to do with this information. He still hasn't been released from his hold on the upper Rappahannock. Uh, this was supposed to be a reconnaissance. That's what he's conducted. Uh, he's gotten the information that the administration wants. Now he has to figure out what's going to happen in the light of this information. So without orders from Washington, Meade masses his infantry along the upper Rappahannock River. His cavalry force is now here along the Rapidan. Only the Second Corps under Governor Warren has entered Culpeper County, and it's up here at Culpeper Courthouse. And Meade sends word back to Washington asking, what do you want me to do? Am I still supposed to hold here on the upper Rappahannock, or am I supposed to advance toward the Rapidan? And if I advance toward the Rapidan, Lee might retreat from the river, especially if Longstreet is gone. Lee is weak. He might decide to pull back closer to Richmond and a better defensive line. But if he doesn't and I advance, it's apt to provoke a battle. And you've said, don't provoke a battle. What do you want me to do? And he doesn't get an answer doesn't get an answer to that question. For 24 hours, he doesn't get an answer to that question. Halleck and Lincoln are distracted by what's going on around Chattanooga, where Rosecrans is beginning to send in rumors that troops from the Army of Northern Virginia are reinforcing Bragg. Uh, and, and maybe that's the reason, but they don't give Meade an answer. They kind of left Meade out there to hang on his own. And so even though the order to hold on the upper Rappahannock has not been rescinded, on the 16th of September, he advances his infantry across the upper Rappahannock to the area of Culpeper Courthouse. And he does this to see what Lee is going to do. So it's kind of the same game that he had been talking about at the beginning of August. If I move down the ONA against a weakened Army of Northern Virginia, what will Lee do? And of course, what we hope he'll do is he'll retreat closer to Richmond, he'll abandon the Rapidan line, and we will be able to take it uh, free of charge. But of course, that's not the way Robert E. Lee uh, plays this game. So Lee is not frightened away. And now Meade has his army inside the Culpeper V, and he knows that Culpeper is as bad a place to have an army on the defensive as Lee does. This is not a place he would choose to put his army, but it's the place that his army now is. And he knows that he can't back up because backing up would look like a retreat. So inside the Culpeper V, he stays. And so he's still waiting for some guidance from Washington. What do you want me to do? Uh, and the guidance is very late uh, in coming. And when it comes, it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, Halleck is going to say, you still can't have a big battle. We still can't reinforce you. Uh, maybe you can cut off part of Lee's army or force him back from, from the Rapidan, but don't do anything rash. And Lincoln is going to say, well, I don't know enough particulars to give any guidance, but perhaps Meade should advance uh, in the form of an offensive and wait to see what the enemy does and perhaps then turn it into a real offensive if the enemy gives him an opening. And none of this is very helpful to George Meade, who's incredibly frustrated. Uh, he had once thought it would be great to be commander of the Army of the Potomac, uh, and now he has discovered that that's not, it's not great at all. It's a horrible job uh, to have. And on September 19th of 1863, he writes a letter to his wife, Margaret. Uh, and this is one of the most revealing letters that George Meade writes uh, over the course of the Civil War. Now, I think most people are aware that his son, after uh, the war, after General Meade's passing, uh, collected the general's letters, uh, edited them, uh, and and publish them. Uh, and these are, of course, a great historical resource. But not all of Meade's letters went into print. Uh, 
And one of the letters that doesn't find its way into that book is the one that he writes at this period of the war on September 19th, 1863. Uh, it, it's, uh, that letter is in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania archives, uh, and uh, it's, it's very revealing. And there's a snippet of it here on the screen, but I'm going to read the whole thing for you because the whole thing uh, tells us a lot about the state of the war in Virginia, in mid-September 1863, it tells us a lot about the relationship between Meade uh, and his superiors. And this is what he writes to Margaret. I made the advance I did under the belief that Lee had sent away a large portion of his army and would perhaps, if threatened, retire to Richmond. I find, however, that he invents no disposition to do so, but is on the contrary posted in a very strong position behind the Rapidan where his inferior numbers can hold me in check and render it very difficult to pierce his line or turn his position. Under these circumstances, I am greatly embarrassed what to do, and I referred the question to Halleck and asked him to give me clear and positive instructions. This, I fear, they will not do. They undoubtedly would be glad if I should attack and prove successful. At the same time, they wish me to assume the responsibility so that in case of disaster, I may, be, I may be made the scapegoat. This position I would be willing to assume if this prerogative was always accorded to me. But being from time to time controlled and directed, and being told this army involves other interests beside its own safety, I have a right to acquire a clear disposition in critical cases like the present. This state of anxiety is very wearing on me, and sometimes I almost wish a stray cannonball would put an end to my troubles. You can imagine that Margaret loved hearing that. <laughs> I'm willing to do my duty and meet any risk or responsibilities that may be legitimately involved, but to be compelled to act one time at the bidding of others and at another time told to act for myself is, I think, unfair. I am so fretted and worried that I fear I shall wear down under it and lose my energy altogether. I tried to support myself with the reflection that my being here is not my act, that I ought to be calm so long as I do the best I can, but the burden is very heavy and oppressive. You must pardon this letter, but you are the only living soul I can write or speak to upon the subject, and I know you want to be apprised of exactly how I feel. Love to all. Pray for me. And I think we can understand why George Meade is asking his wife, for his prayers. He has advanced without being given permission to advance. He's asked for clear instructions about whether the administration wishes him to go over to the offensive, and he hasn't got them. And it seems to him that for Lincoln and Halleck and Stanton, the most important thing is that they keep their fingerprints off whatever is going to happen next that if there is a battle and there is a defeat, that it can be blamed on Meade and not on them. They don't want to tell him to advance, have him advance, fight and lose a battle. Then the Democrats will turn around and say, this is Lincoln pushing Meade to fight when Meade wasn't ready. They're not going to let that happen. But this means that Meade is left dangling in the wind, having to decide what to do. And now that he is in Culpeper County, there is an expectation that he will do something, especially if there is true to the rumors that the Confederates are concentrating against Rosecrans in Tennessee. The problem for me is what to do. If the Confederates are behind the Rapidan, a direct frontal assault on their fortifications is suicide, not an option. The only thing he can do, therefore, is either try and turn the left of Lee's line or turn the right of Lee's line. Now, to the left is the wilderness and the great Chancellorsville battlefield, and beyond that, Fredericksburg. And the Federals have operated there many, many times over the course of the war. They know the lay of the land. They know the road net. They know the forts. But to the west, toward Lee's left flank, you have Madison County. And the Federals have never operated in strength in Madison County. And one of the you know, really remarkable things that one learns as you study this, this period of the war very carefully is how much of Virginia is still a blank slate to the Federals. Uh, they have only the vaguest idea of the roads uh, and their condition and the fords and that sort of thing. 
And so if Meade wants all of his options, he, he needs to know what the lay of the land is in Madison County. So on September 22nd of 1863, he has Pleasanton launch another reconnaissance. And this reconnaissance is going to be conducted by both Buford and Kilpatrick's division, uh, two-thirds of the federal cavalry. Interestingly, Pleasanton doesn't go himself, and so uh, this is very different than Jeb Stewart. If Jeb Stewart was doing this, he would be right there at the forefront. Uh, but Pleasanton is a headquarters operator. Buford is put in charge of this operation. And so the two federal cavalry divisions cross Robinson's River. They come down to Madison Courthouse, and from there, they divide with Kilpatrick going off to the west uh, and then down to the Rapidan to scout the fords. Uh, Buford now, with just uh, two brigades, is going to take one of them under Chapman uh, toward the Rapidan, but the second under Devon is going to diverge and go here to the southwest uh, to check out a different set of fords. And so the federal column is going to be split into three and ultimately four a separate contingents. The Confederates have been forewarned of all of this by a federal deserter who's come in and said the Union cavalry supported by a corps of infantry is going to enter uh, Madison County. Uh, Jeb Stewart uh, has just reorganized his cavalry into a corps uh, of two divisions. One of those divisions under Fitzhugh Lee is guarding the right flank of the Army of Northern Virginia in the direction of Fredericksburg. The second division, which technically is Wade Hampton's division, is under Stewart's personal control because Wade Hampton is still recuperating from his Gettysburg wounds. And as the Confederates see things, this is perceived not as a reconnaissance, but as a potential raid on Gordonsville and the Virginia Central Railroad, which, of course, they must defend in order to uh, keep the supplies flowing. So Stewart takes charge of uh, Wade Hampton's division, and he moves it into Madison County to meet the federal threat. Uh, and this is going to produce the Battle of Jack's Shop on September 22nd of 1863. This is a kind of famous little battle, but it's famous for the wrong reasons because there's a lot of mythology uh, that's built up around it. Uh, at one point, it's claimed that Stuart is surrounded on three sides and he has to cut his way out. And as he tries to withdraw toward the rapid end, the Federals are on both sides of the road shooting into his column. And uh, that's not the way that this battle uh, happens at all. So Stuart, uh, with Hampton's division, moves up toward Jack's shop uh, meets Chapman's brigade with Buford himself personally there and a battery of artillery uh, coming down from Madison Courthouse, and you have the initial engagement. Uh, and the Federals are not very aggressive here, which puzzles Stewart a little bit. Uh, why aren't they pushing very hard? Uh, but Stewart does know that Kilpatrick has slipped off to the West. He's not ignorant of that fact. His scouts have told him. So he doesn't know where Kilpatrick is, but he makes provisions to meet Kilpatrick if he were to show up. He scatters scouts out to his rear, and he keeps half of the division that he's got with him pointed toward the Rapidan in case the, the Federals under Kilpatrick try to attack his rear. And of course, this turns out to be a very, very wise move, uh, because as soon as Buford had made contact with Stuart at Jack's shop. He had sent a courier racing to Kilpatrick to tell him to cross the Rapidan and attack the Confederates in the rear. Obviously, it takes a long time for that courier to get to Kilpatrick, and by the time that he does, Kilpatrick has already scattered his division. Uh, Custer's brigade is off to the west scouting out Fords. Uh, Davy has sent some of his own regiments uh, on the same kind of uh, mission, so that when the courier reaches Kilpatrick, Davy just has a couple of regiments and a battery of artillery. That's all he's got. And nonetheless, he does what he's told. He moves across the Rapidan to the north, and he's told to move to Jack's shop, but he's not really told very much more by Buford. He has no idea what is happening around Jack's shop, how many Confederates are there, uh, or, or anything. So he's kind of going into this situation blindly. And as he marches down a little road toward Jack's shop, he's moving through a forest that's so dense, his column can only ride uh, in twos. And that's going to, of course, make it very difficult to deploy uh, when he finds the Confederates, which he does. And as he comes out of the woods, he's surprised to see a, a whole Confederate brigade and part of another 
drawn up in line of battle waiting for him. So the idea was that Kilpatrick was going to hit the Confederate rear and surprise Jeb Stuart, but instead it's Kilpatrick who's surprised. The enemy is waiting for him. And this is the dramatic moment when the Confederate horse artillery uh, is forced to fire in two directions, some of its guns shooting north toward Buford, some of them turning around on the same hillside and firing south toward Kilpatrick. Uh, Kilpatrick, of course, and Davies realized very quickly, oh my gosh, we blundered into a hornet's nest here. We're grossly outnumbered, and we need to escape. We need to get away. So the Federals fight a little bit of a delaying action until they can get onto the road that leads them back to the Rapidan. Uh, and now the Confederates become the pursuers. Uh, the, they disengage from Chapman and Buford, who are happy to let them go. Kilpatrick and Davies are making a run toward the river. Stewart has sent word to uh, Wilcox's infantry division to hurry to Liberty Mills and block the federal retreat. Confederate infantry is just too late to accomplish that. Kilpatrick and Davies managed to get across the Rapidan at Liberty Mills and then retreat to the west with Stewart in hot pursuit. And just at dusk along Marsh Run, the Federals turn and make a stand, and you have a twilight skirmish, really very dramatic affair, uh, that uh, holds the Confederates at bay. And that evening, Kilpatrick uh, pulls back across the Rapidan. The rest of his division concentrates with Buford around Providence Church, uh, and from there, the Federals are going to uh, begin their retreat uh, back into Culpeper with Stuart in hot pursuit. Uh, there's some vigorous rear guard fighting here, but the Federals do manage to get away. And so two days of fighting the Battle of Jack's Shop, and at the end of it, both sides believe that they have achieved a victory. Uh, Buford brags that, hey, Stuart's whole division resisted me. Of course, it was only half of the Confederate cavalry. Nonetheless, I was resisted by all the Confederate cavalry, uh, and yet I made the reconnaissance. I went into Madison County. I found out about the roads. I found out about the fords. I learned everything that General Meade wants me to know, and therefore my mission has been a success. The Confederates believing that they had fended off a raid against the Virginia Central and Gordonsville bragged that the Federals were not able to accomplish their mission. We drove them back into Culpeper and with loss. And so both sides acting on their own perception of what was going on uh, rightfully declare that they have come out as the victor. So Meade now knows something about what the ground is like on his right flank. And this should give him enough information to determine whether <clears throat> he's going to try and get it Lee by either crossing the Rapidan to Lee's left or crossing the Rapidan to Lee's right. But events are going to dictate otherwise, because on the very day that Stuart and uh, Chapman and Kilpatrick are all tangling with each other, the Battle of Chickamauga is reaching its climax in Georgia. Uh, Rosecrans' army is defeated uh, in large part because Confederate troops under Longstreet arrive in time to hit a weak spot in the federal line and rout uh, the right and, and center of Rosecrans army and send it fleeing back into Chattanooga. Uh, and uh, when word of this gets to Washington, it's going to have a dramatic effect on the conduct of operations in Virginia. So Lincoln and his administration find out that there's been this horrible defeat at Chickamauga. The question for the Federals now is what to do about it, because the tide has turned. Bragg is following up his victory. It's going to be the Federals now who are trying to figure out how to hold on to Chattanooga, not the Confederates, and how are they going to do that? And so Meade is called to Washington to talk with Stanton and Halleck and Lincoln about what could be done. And there is the suggestion made that the Army of the Potomac pull back closer to Washington, D.C., where it will be easier to supply it, where there are fortifications for it to rest in. And once the army is close to Washington, it will be possible to pull troops away from Meade and send them to help Rosecrans in Tennessee. Meade argues against that. In the same way that Lee had argued against sending part of his army to the West, Meade argues against sending part of his army to the West. And he says, no, I, 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 I think that's a mistake. Uh, I'm on the verge, hopefully, of launching an offensive. 
uh, and it would be a bad idea to break up this army. And Meade makes that argument, uh, believes that he's won that argument. He goes back to his army convinced uh, that it's going to be left intact. But no sooner does Meade leave Washington for AOP headquarters than Lincoln and Stanton and Halleck uh, convene a midnight conference uh, in the War Department uh, where they discuss the situation themselves. And there's a division of opinion. Stanton proposes taking two corps from the Army of the Potomac and shipping it west to reinforce Rosecrans. And he says that in five days, uh, he can get those two corps into the vicinity of Chattanooga. Uh, Lincoln, who's pretty cynical about things by this point in the war, uh, quips that if the order was given tonight, it would be unlikely that the truce could be gotten to Washington within those five days. But nonetheless, Stanton makes the point that, look, Meade greatly outnumbers Lee, and he always has, and yet he's done nothing and he's doing nothing, and he's not going to do anything. His numbers where they are are wasted and not necessary when those troops can be used in Chattanooga. If Meade's only going to sit on the defensive, he doesn't need the big army that he has, uh, and we can reinforce Rosecrans. Lincoln and Halleck, on the other hand, are not convinced by that. They perceive that there is an opportunity here to really do something in Virginia. If, in fact, Longstreet has gone west, and there's no doubt about that now, then Lee is weak and Meade is strong, and wouldn't this be the moment for a much stronger Army of the Potomac to move out and strike against a weakened Army of Northern Virginia? And that logic kind of unassailable, unless you believe, as Stanton is arguing, that you can't count on Meade to do anything, that despite those odds, he's not going to take advantage of them. And that is very hard for Lincoln and Halleck to argue against. So they agreed to transfer two of Lee's, uh, Meade's corps uh, to Tennessee on the proviso that Meade is not on the, the immediate precipice of launching an offensive. So on the evening of September 23rd, a message is sent to Army of Potomac headquarters, and the question is asked, are you on the verge of launching an offensive? And Meade sends back word, well, i Buford's just gotten back. I'm digesting his reconnaissance. And no, we don't have any immediate plan. And when Halleck takes that to Lincoln, Lincoln says, not good enough. Mr. Stanton is right. And so the order goes out for the 11th and 12th Corps to be detached from the Army of the Potomac and sent west to help redeem the situation in Chattanooga. And although this uh, disappoints Meade, he is a dutiful soldier and he accepts the order. He does it without complaint and he does it with great efficiency. To Lincoln's surprise, within 24 hours, these two corps are uh, in the environs of Washington and on their way west. So this was an exceptionally fast movement. Uh, it shows that Meade is indeed competent in terms of managing his army, and he's not the kind of guy who's going to push back against the dictates he receives from Washington, even if he thinks that those dictates are uh, sometimes wrong and to him and his army personally unfair. So where does that leave us? Uh, it leaves us at the beginning of October uh, with this situation. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia still behind the Rapidan with all of the fords heavily fortified. The Army of the Potomac inside the Culpeper V, which is a very, very bad place for an army to be. Meade had sent his infantry, or some of it, to the Rapidan to free up Pleasanton's cavalry for the reconnaissance into Madison County. So now he's got the 1st and the 6th Corps uh, right on the river with the 5th Corps close behind. Uh, and this means that his army uh, is in a very delicate position because it doesn't know what Lee's doing behind the high ground south of the river. And it is vulnerable, as Meade knows and fears, to a Confederate flank march that would come through Madison County and either attempt to get between Meade and Washington and cut the Army of the Potomac's line of supply or to swing down into Culpeper County and attack the Army from the West, driving it into the apex of that narrow Culpeper V where it would have to fight with its back against a potentially dangerous river uh, and the possibility would exist that it might be mauled, if not destroyed. Meade sees it. Robert E. Lee sees it. 
And Robert E. Lee, seeing such an opportunity, is not going to neglect it. He's been wanting to go over to the offensive since mid-August, and now the opportunity has presented itself as soon as he confirms that two corps of the Army of Northern uh, Army of the Potomac have, have left, uh, he is going to launch an offensive. Uh, ironically, uh, the departure of those two corps are not going to change Meade's strength at all. About 13,000 men go west with the 11th and the 12th Corps, and just as they depart, all of those troops that Meade had sent north to enforce the draft come back to the Army of the Potomac, and so that balances things out. Lee has 55,000 men, Meade has roughly 90,000, but for Meade, what matters is he's lost two corps, and therefore he is now strictly on the defensive. For Lee, what matters is the Federals have lost two corps, and even though I'm grossly outnumbered, I see an opportunity to go over to the attack, and on August 8th and 9th of 1863, that is what Lee is going to do, which will bring us to the Bristow Station campaign, which is the second half of the book in my Meade and Lead series that we're talking about tonight and will be the topic of my talk to all of you uh, next month. Let me get on, wait a minute. I wanna get my picture on, wait a minute. Uh, am I on, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Before we take any questions, I gotta set ground rules um, before we get started, um, we have a number of people. It's a long lecture. One, uh, there are other people that are asking questions, and uh, Abigail will run the chat, or you can run your own chat on this. One, I ask that they be questions, no statements. I know you know the rule, laws that are, but don't give another speech. We came to hear uh, Jeff Hunt. That's what it's all about. Number two, um, Again, those same. There was over ten thousand books written on the Civil War. You can't go in Catton's book on page four thirty two of Stillness at Appomattox. What do you think of that page? You know, you can't do that. So I will stop anybody who quotes any other book. That's totally unfair. I've given talks like that, and people do that. They come out, they pick up some esoteric book or whatever it is, or any book for God's sake. You know, don't do that. So you got questions? Great lecture. And, it's, you know, actually, when you just ended it, it's like when I was a kid, they, was, they were called chapters. You go to the movie, it was a half hour, and then the guy was going off. And continue next month. That's what you did. And I think that's great. And I, I must compliment it. But, so it's like, I got to know what happens next month, you know, <laughs> through that. My congratulations on this uh, uh, great talk. Okay. You could uh, oh, you can see the name up there for the books. Um, and then when your new book comes out, that's when we'll buy the uh We'll buy the uh, the other books through that. Uh, okay, any questions? I'll let you handle the chat box yourself or whoever's handling it. Abigail, you see him? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, it's not too many questions right now. Um, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, concerning the reinforcing of the Army of the Potomac, when Grant took control of the Army, he was able to add forces by taking troops from the fortifications around Washington, D.C. Why didn't they allow me to do the same thing? Essentially, the administration does not have the confidence in George Meade that it has in Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, one of the interesting things about this period, of course, is that uh, Grant is uh, basically idle. Uh, after the capture of Vicksburg, as Sherman launches his raid in the Mississippi to Meridian, destroys a bunch of railroad. Uh, but uh, there is no employment for U.S. Grant. He has that uh, that accident in New Orleans uh, with the horse uh, and is laid up, uh, uh, you know, injured uh, for some weeks uh, afterwards. Uh, but uh, there is no idea at this point in the war of making Grant general in chief or anything like that. In fact, uh, there are indications in the official records that uh, where Halleck actually sends a letter to me. And he says, hey, look, if the Confederates are, are going to concentrate against Rosecrans, it's because they know that if you and Rosecrans can hold your own uh, in your respective theaters while, quote, Grant and Banks clear out the Confederates in the Trans-Mississippi, unquote, the Confederate causes doom. 
Uh, so it kind of sounds like the idea was that uh, Grant was going to go with banks into the Trans-Mississippi, or maybe he was going to operate against Mobile, Alabama, which was uh, Grant's preferred uh, target. Uh, and it is not going to be until the Confederate uh, success at Chickamauga that Grant is going to be brought over to save the day at Chattanooga. And when he does that, it's after that success that people begin to talk about Grant as a general in chief. And of course, by then, Grant has proven himself at Vicksburg. He's proven himself at Chattanooga. Uh, he's proven that he's the kind of general uh, that Lincoln wants. But that is not quite evident uh, in September uh, of 1863 and earlier. Um, Lincoln and Halleck are going to forgive Meade his failure to destroy the Army of Northern Virginia above the Potomac after Gettysburg. In fact, in uh, late July, Halleck writes a very nice and very long letter to Meade saying, look, um, don't feel badly about that. Don't, don't let the president's disappointment bother you. I'm sure you're disappointed. But these things happen. Uh, and, and sometimes they happen through no fault of our own. Uh, and, and you did as good as you could do. And don't let that worry you. But but Meade is wounded by that. He's never going to quite get over the idea uh, that the president uh, was unhappy with his performance after the Battle of Gettysburg. And although Lincoln and Halleck and, are going to forgive Meade, Stanton never really does, uh, they're never going to be able to forget that. Uh, and then when Meade fails to push through the Blue Ridge Mountains and trap Lee in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, the, the, that adds to it. Uh, and so uh, they are beginning to get the sense that Meade is very much a McClellan-style general, and that's certainly the word that's going around Washington, D.C., uh, because Meade talks a lot like McClellan talked like. He, he supply problems and guarding his communications, and Meade has a very adroit strategic mind. He can look at the, the Virginia theater. He can see the difficulties of operating there. He can see the advantages that the Confederates have. Uh, and all of this is legitimate. And it's not that the administration denies the legitimacy of what he's saying, but every time that Meade talks, they hear George McClellan. <laughs> and that's really what it comes down to. Every time they hear me talk, they hear George McClellan. And McClellan, of course, had been a giant disappointment to the administration. He had been a great organizer. He had been a great uh, a logistician. Uh, he, he understood strategy. Uh, but when push came to shove, he did not have that aggressive killer instinct. And the Lincoln administration uh, is getting the feeling that Meade doesn't have it either. Uh, and this is kind of unfair. Meade's following their orders. Uh, if he had been let loose, would he have acted differently? Uh, what would have happened if he'd been allowed to push down the Orange in Alexandria in late July of 1863 instead of having to send troops to reinforce the draft? We do not know. Uh, but certainly uh, in that six-week lull that where Meade feels like, well, I'm doing what you told me to do, I'm sitting still, Lincoln and Halleck and Stanton seem to feel that Meade should have been badgering them to let him go on to the offensive, that if he was really looking to land a blow against the Confederates somewhere, uh, he would have landed it in mid-September. He wouldn't still be trying to figure out whether he should go left or right uh, at the end of the month. Uh, uh, you know, when Chickamauga happens. And so uh, lacking that confidence in Meade, uh, they're not going to let him have those troops around Washington. And, and uh, to be fair to them, Meade does not ask for those troops. He, he, he kind of understands that uh, probably that Washington has to be well defended uh, and to take those troops out of those defenses uh, would probably not be a wise thing uh, to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you use the word recuperate after Gettysburg. Uh, had Lincoln, Stanton, and the others finally and fully realized the toll exhaustion that was taken by the Army of the Potomac in Gettysburg? I, I'm sorry, could you? Uh, you're, you're a little echoey on me there. So if you could say that again. Okay, regarding the you used the word recuperate after Gettysburg. Uh -huh. uh, had uh, had Lincoln, Stanton, and the others realized the and understood the toll exhaustion that had taken place 
they yeah. they do yeah. understand the toll that had taken place, at least in in the big picture. Uh, and of course, you know, Lincoln's got to go and give his famous speech at the cemetery, so he's going to look at the physical evidence of it there. But here's the thing. Yes, the Army of the Potomac was grievously wounded at Gettysburg. So was the Army of Northern Virginia. And uh, one of the themes that Lincoln is constantly throwing out to his generals is, why can we not fight? Why can we not march like Lee fights and like Lee marches? So your Army General Meade is far larger. Your army is much better supplied. It is much better equipped. It has enormous resources behind it. The Confederate army is small. The Confederate army is poorly supplied. The Confederate army does not have anything like the depth of resources behind it. And yet somehow it is always looking to fight. It is always ready to go onto the offensive. It is ready to maneuver aggressively. It maneuvers quickly and adroitly. Why can't the Army of the Potomac do that? Why do you have this ponderous machine when the Confederates move like a featherweight boxer and are constantly uh, discombobulating you as a result? Uh, and so the relative casualties are exactly that. They are relative casualties. And the Confederates are always going to be hurt worse as a percentage of their army in any battle than the Army of the Potomac is. Even if the numerical casualties are the same, uh, that's a much higher percentage of the Confederate army than it is of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and so that's really not uh, not an excuse as far as they're concerned for the way that, uh, that uh, Meade operates. So let's remember the thing that Lincoln is supposed to have said after the Battle of Fredericksburg, as horrible as that was, he sits down and he says, if we fought that same battle with the same casualties for an entire week, at the end of that week, the Army of Northern Virginia would be gone. And the Army of the Potomac would still have 40,000 men and be a gigantic host. And so what we need, and we will, and, and the moment we win the war is when we find the general who can stand up to that arithmetic. And Lincoln has pretty much already decided that George Meade is not the general who can, can face that arithmetic, rightly or, or wrongly. Uh, Meade uh, is certainly not afraid to fight. He is personally exceptionally brave. Uh, he's more than capable of handling an army. Uh, but remember, he knows that the North is facing this enormous manpower problem. Uh, what, what better proof that he had to send 13,000 of his men to enforce the draft, and that prevented him from continuing the pursuit of Lee after Gettysburg. Uh, the two-year men went home. In the spring, the three-year men are probably going to go home. What kind of army am I going to have after the three-year men go home? And if I go out and get a whole bunch of my men killed and wounded, and all I achieve is pushing the Confederates a little bit closer to Richmond, where their supply line will be shorter and they'll be in their defenses, what will I have accomplished? And so if I'm going to fight battles, I want to fight battles where I believe I have a fair chance of not only winning, but achieving some something strategic, something important that will be commensurate with the loss of life and the damage done to the Army of the Potomac. To fight for the sake of fighting, push the enemy back, simply to push him back is not wise strategy as far as George Meade is concerned. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question you have is, um, where did Lee get the troops from to build back his army after his Gettysburg losses? Yeah, in the same place the Army of the Potomac did. Uh, mostly convalescents, uh, wounded men and sick men returning to the ranks after the battles of Fredericksburg and particularly Chancellorsville. Uh, there's a smidgen of recruits and there are conscripts and substitutes in the Confederate Army, uh, just like uh, in the Army of the Potomac. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, has anyone thought about publishing Meade's uh, unabridged letters? You know, it would be a grand project. And what I would like to see somebody do is not only publish uh, Meade's letters, but Margaret's letters back to Meade. Uh, because she was a very savvy uh, politician. Her father had been a congressman. Uh, he'd been a vice presidential uh, candidate for the Liberty Party uh, before the war. Uh, she she uh, was very smart uh, and, and a keen observer. And it would be really neat to see what their back and forth was. I, I don't know that anybody is going to work on that project. It would be a big project. Uh, but I, I think that uh, those who study uh, Meade and uh, the Army of the Potomac would find it uh, something very worthwhile to purchase if somebody did the work. 
before we go um, into, um, well, Abigail, take the uh, last question. We'll end at eight thirty. But somebody did ask a question. We always meet the fourth Thursday. So whatever the fourth Thursday of April is, one, two, three, four, is April twenty five. That'll be the that'll be the continuation. And again, uh, roll weights of uh, Richmond Roundtable will be uh, giving a presentation. I noticed from Bill Walsh from this uh, Richmond Roundtable is also on. Okay, I think there is just one more question, and that is, is Meade's perception of Lincoln and Stanton regarding his course of action accurate or lack of action? So he has every reason, I think, to believe that he is being treated unfairly. Uh, that at one moment he's being told, well, you must do X, Y, Z. And at the next moment he's being told, well, figure it out for yourself. Uh, and, and the perception is that, uh, you know, they want him to be the scapegoat. And he he writes uh, at a different point in the war that this has been the fate of all my predecessors. You know, that they, they, they were assured of the support of the administration. They go out, they fight a battle, they lose it. And then what's the next thing that happened? Their head's on the chopping block. And isn't it ridiculous that in 12 months, there have been four men in command of the Army of the Potomac. That, that we, we, look, we look ridiculous uh, to the world, changing our commanders uh, like this. Uh, Meade is appalled that they do not accept the logic of leaving the origin Alexandria behind and going to Aquia Landing and making that the new base of advance for the Army of the Potomac, because the military logic there is impeccable. You, you can't argue that if he could get across the, the, the river at Fredericksburg uh, without the Confederates doing a, a Burnside Fredericksburg scenario to him, then he's clearly on the shortest direct route to Richmond if you have to operate there. Meade believes that Peninsula is actually the ideal route to get at Richmond, but he admits, well, McClellan's ruined that for everybody. He actually writes that. McClellan ruined that. So if we have to advance overland toward Richmond, we should be doing it uh, from Aquia Landing uh, heading south. And militarily, that's impeccable logic. Uh, and what Meade doesn't understand, of course, is that Lincoln in particular cannot just look at things from a military standpoint. Uh, there is the political to consider as well. But then there's also this. Lincoln, through Halleck, tells Meade, look, if you go to Fredericksburg, you're still going to find Lee in front of you. You're still going to find him in a strong position where he has dug in and has all these advantages. If you if you leave Culpeper County and go to Fredericksburg, you're just transferring your difficulties from one point to another. You're going to have to fight the same enemy. Richmond is not your goal. The Army of Northern Virginia is your goal. Your job is to go out and grind it into a pulp. Meade's retort is, well, if you want me to fight Lee and grind him into a pulp, I've actually got to have a battlefield to do that. And I have to have a battlefield where I can win, where I can mass more troops than him, and he doesn't have all the advantages, or the grinding is apt to go in the other direction. Uh, and so they're really kind of talking past each other. Uh, they both sort of understand what the other one is saying, but they believe that their point of view should trump the other guy. Uh, and it's a very dysfunctional relationship. Uh, and um, and in all likelihood, uh, after the Mine Run campaign, Meade would have been fired if they had not been able to foist that, that job off to Grant uh, to let him decide. Of course, he decides to keep Meade because he's impressed with him. Uh, a little ahead of my story there. Uh, but yes, uh, Meade has every reason to, to be disgruntled with the administration. And uh, from their perspective, the administration has every reason to be disgruntled with Meade. All right, that's a look. Um, we'll take that as a last question. It's it's a chase it's chase thirty. Um, let me just wrap it up. Uh, before I go to wrap it up, I want to give him congratulations to Rich Jankowski. He just got his doctorate in the past within the past month. Uh, so congratulations, Rich. Um, next two months, we're going to have two Lincoln uh, lectures by uh, Professor Jonathan Laurie of Rutgers. He's addressed our uh, group before. Uh, on, on a number of occasions, when you get a lecture next month, but in, uh, when you get a lecture for the next two months, this is given almost on a graduate level. This isn't Lincoln was a 16th president uh, type of thing. It goes into depth, just as you heard tonight. And we, uh, and if you know, and obviously Lincoln is a big name. So we ask really that you pass this one on. This is important. Um, I was really glad to get Professor Laurie back again. And for those who are from New Jersey, 
His wife, Maxine Laurie, was the head of the history department at Seton Hall University. Um, and sh briefly, sh she'll be doing a pre hopefully a presentation on the New Jersey Historical Society, of which she is the president. And Tom D'Amico will know her because she's written quite a number of books on the, Amer uh, Amer the women of the American Revolution. So for that, uh, happy Easter have, to all of you. I have a question. Rich, I have a question. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Gina Marie. Um, Go ahead. First of all, thank you very much. It was very educational. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, and are the two that are coming going to be in person slash hybrid or are they going to be Zoom? No, we're all, I got to tell you something. All our programs are going to be uh, Zoom from now on. Um, I think okay. people have gotten used to it and then the hybrid, I don't know. But Okay. So Monday, yeah. you and I need to chat then, please. Okay, sure. We'll, okay. we'll work out something together. Right. Or maybe, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, when do you want me to call? Oh, tomorrow's a uh, good Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah Monday. Uh, get, reach out to me on Monday. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Much. Okay, Easter. thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent yeah. talk. Good night. Okay, Thanks. meeting ending now. Okay, ending now.